Hi everyone, and welcome to episode 60 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sobalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. They say that a man's home is his castle, which means that, well... Nearly all of us are spending a whole lot of time in castles these days. So I thought today we would talk a little bit about castles because that's something we haven't talked about before. And uh, I'm just going to give you a whole bunch of information about what castles were like, what some of the terminology that we use around castles is in case that's something that, I don't know, just speaks to the nerd in you as it does in me, or it's something that you might find useful for a project that you're doing if you're finally writing that medieval novel or comic book or that kind of thing. So let's talk about castles. So castles are what a lot of people think of as the defining feature of the Middle Ages. What sets the Middle Ages apart from other time periods? Well, we picture castles, right? The earliest castles were not very different from wooden forts like you'd see pretty much anywhere else all over the world. These castles tended to be of a Mott and Bailey construction. So a Mott is an artificial or a real hill, a small little mound, and you'd put your castle building, which we'll talk about in a second, on top of that mott. And then around it, you would put either a ditch or a wall or both. And that part would surround the middle part, the mott, and it would create a space inside called the bailey. So people started building these Mott and Bailey castles. They stopped calling them forts and they started calling them castles. If we look at the etymology, that's the origin of words. And I love etymology. It's something I always geek out about. So I'm going to inflict that upon you (laughs) during this podcast. The etymology for castle seems to come from the Latin castellum or castrum, which means fort. So that makes a whole lot of sense. But here's something that I learned in high school and I think is really cool. And maybe you'll think is cool as well. Castellum or castrum took the form in Old English of Chester, which sounds a lot like Chester, which is the origin of the word Chester. So if you find a place that's called Chester in England or Scotland or Wales or Ireland, it probably means that that place had a fort. So Winchester, Rochester, or just Chester, they're all places that had a fort or maybe an early castle. So Mott and Bailey castles were the style of castles till into the 11th century, although it's not like people didn't think of building in stone before, but they started to be built in stone a lot more in the 11th and 12th centuries. So we talked about building a mott. If you don't have a hill that you can build your castle on, build a mott yourself. This is something that you can create by digging that ditch and then using that dirt to build yourself a little hill. And when I first started learning about castles, I thought like this idea of a mott, a man-made mott is kind of crazy because I don't know, I've built sand castles before. (laughs) It never seemed like the hill was all that strong. But actually one of the most famous castles in England, York Castle, which is also called Clifford's Tower, was built by William the Conqueror. And that is on an artificial mott, which if you look at it, it makes a whole lot of sense because it's a very symmetrical mound that it's built on. But that is an artificial mott. Now you know. Okay, so on top of the mott, you'd build what we tend to think of as the castle, that central tower, that central building, it's actually called the keep. That's what we tend to call it. In old French, it was called donjon, which gives us dungeon. Because if you were living in England and you were a native English person and you got hauled off by the Normans to the donjon, maybe something not awesome was going to happen to you there. So donjon became dungeon in English. But a donjon or a keep is just that central building that we tend to think of as the castle, the keep in the middle of all the other walls that make up the castle. So early walls around the bailey part of the castle used to be kind of a palisade fence type of thing like you'd see everywhere. But obviously, as people settled really permanently in these areas, they wanted to build a stronger wall. And so they did. A lot of castle walls are at least 10 feet thick, if not 15 or 20 or more, which is really, really thick, (laughs) which is really important when you're trying to keep a whole bunch of bad guys out. Now, it's a little bit tricky to find that much stone and cut all that stone and fit it together. So the trick that they used to use was to build the outside of the wall 
and the inside of the wall, and then they'd fill in that space, that blank space, the 10 feet between the inner part and the outer part with fill, rocks and dirt and all sorts of things you could compact and make a really tight wall without having to carve each individual rock. Now in some places they did carve each individual rock which takes a lot of time but you're building if you're building a castle quickly you might just build kind of the inner part of the wall and the outer part of the wall and fill it in with rubble rock and sand and stone and all that kind of stuff. At the top of the wall we know what gives the castle its classic silhouette is something called crenellations and those are those little bits of stone that stick up and then they go down and they stick up and they go down kind of like teeth the top of the castle wall has crenellations and that is a place where you can hide your archers so they can step out they can shoot they can go and hide behind that little section of the wall and that word crenellations comes to us from the latin crena which means notch and that's also where we get the word cranny. See, I told you I love etymology. So as people are building castle walls, they realize that if one wall is good, then more walls are better. And they start to build castles with concentric rings of walls. And you see that especially in later castles. William the Conqueror was a big castle builder in the 11th century. And then Edward I was a big castle builder in the 13th century. And Edward I's castles have a lot of concentric walls. Now I'm using a lot of English and Scottish examples today because those are the castles I've actually seen with my own eyes. But obviously there are all sorts of amazing castles all over Europe and the Middle East for people to look at. So we have these concentric walls on the outside of a castle and often they will have towers that are built into those so that you can watch and see what's coming so that you can build rooms into the walls so that you can use that extra space. And one thing that you might notice in older castles, the outer walls and the keeps, they're built in squares or rectangles. They have very sharp corners. William the Conqueror's castles, a lot of his castles had very sharp corners. The Tower of London is one, the white tower in the middle. Rochester Castle, also very square. But as time went on, people started to realize that you'd have a stronger castle if you build round walls. And one of the things that kind of made people feel like they needed to develop this new round wall technology was the development of the trebuchet. When those trebuchets threw a stone at a corner, they could obliterate it pretty well. But if they threw it at a rounded tower, it would distribute the impact. Rochester Castle is a really great example because you can see William the Conqueror built it square, so three of its corners are square, but in the early 13th century, King John besieged his own castle, <laughs> besieged Rochester Castle, and he took down one of the walls of the castle. But when it was rebuilt later, it was built with one round tower. So the tower that fell and King John's siege was rebuilt as a round tower so that it would be stronger if it was ever besieged again. One other thing I want to say about Rochester Castle and the White Tower, William the Conqueror's castles, these ones were supervised by the Bishop of Rochester at the time, and his name was Gundolf. And if you think that sounds a lot like a wizard's name, you are very correct. You just have to switch out two U's for two A's and you get Gandalf. So I just think that's an interesting bit of trivia. Gundolf, Bishop of Rochester, was one of the people who supervised William the Conqueror's castle building. So we're talking about Rochester Castle losing one of its towers. That happened through undermining. And this is another word that I think is a great one to know and have it was undermined, which literally means that people mined underneath the walls of that tower. And in this case, the tunnel that they built, they kept it strong by putting wooden struts in there to keep the ceiling of the tunnel from collapsing. And then they smeared pig fat on this and lit it on fire. And that's what brought down the wall of Rochester Castle. So if you hear about people who are undermining you, they are literally mining underneath you and trying to bring down your foundations. So... So someone who undermines you is someone that is really out to get you. Don't trust that person. Okay, so we're talking about walls. We're talking about concentric walls. We're talking about round walls. 
One other thing I want to say about walls is you'll notice if you look at castles, for example, Rochester Castle, it is a very, very tall castle. Same with the White Tower. Same with the towers that were built in Edward I's time. Very tall castles. Uh, very tall keeps. And as time goes on, as you get into the Tudor time, you'll notice the castles start to shrink. Their walls are not that tall anymore. And that is because the threat of the trebuchet wasn't really there anymore. People were starting to use cannons. So instead of throwing something over the walls, throwing something high up on the walls, people were just blasting walls with cannons. And in that case, it's not so necessary to build your walls very tall. You just need to build them thick. So that's one of the reasons that castle walls kind of shrunk as time went on and the Middle Ages started to end. So if we think about the outer walls of a castle, we think about besieging these outer walls, we know that they have a lot of defenses in them. So sometimes they'd have holes in the walls that were very, very thin slits, and that was so that you could shoot arrows out of them. They're very, very thin slits on the outside. Usually they open up in kind of a triangle shape on the inside so that you could stand on either side of the slit and shoot very well from inside. So we know that there's arrow slits in these walls if they're not super thick. We also, when we think of a castle wall, right, we think about a drawbridge, right? There's always a moat. <laughs> if we're talking about etymology, again, moat is one of these words that seems to have come from mot. So it seems to have come from the word for the hill that the keep is built on. And it actually just started to move over time to mean the ditch that's surrounding the castle itself. And if you'd filled it with water, it's the moat that we know today. Either way, if you had a ditch or if you had a moat, somebody needs to cross it over the drawbridge. Drawbridges, you often see them in media, and they take a really long time to winch up as people are coming. And this is something I've thought about a lot of times. One thing I saw was an, an idea about what people thought the drawbridge was like at the Tower of London. I don't know where I saw this. If it was on Secrets of Great British Castles, I'm sorry, Dan, I forgot. <laughs> One of, the, uh, one of the things that people think that was the design of the drawbridge at the Tower of London is that it would swing itself up so that its position down flat was kind of the unnatural position so that when they cut the ropes, the heavy part of the drawbridge would swing down, leaving the door part or the bridge part to swing up and close. That idea makes a whole lot more sense to me rather than trying to frantically winch up a bridge as people are trying to come across it but that's something to look into if you like draw bridges look into that design I think it's I think it's kind of cool and it might be something that happened more often than we might realize so you've crossed the drawbridge you've gotten across it somehow often you come to a portcullis and a portcullis is that big gate that comes down from the ceiling and it slams down and either keeps you out or there are two of them and they keep you in. So a portcullis might slam behind you as you get in and another one might slam in front of you, trapping you in a little space between two gates, which is not a place that you wanna be for a bunch of reasons. People can still shoot you through these portcullises, right? They're gates, they can shoot you through those and they could shoot you often from little arrow slits on either side in the stone walls. So if those are guard towers, and they're often guard towers, people could shoot you from the side as well. So you're a sitting duck. And if you look up, you might see holes called murder holes <laughs> for obvious reasons. This would be a place, if a castle had a murder hole, this would be a place where guards could drop down boiling water or hot sand on you as you're stuck like a fish in a barrel. They wouldn't often pour boiling oil on you because oil is not that easy to get, relatively speaking. Water is a lot easier to get and heat and you can just use boiling water. That's just going to work as well. Also sand, if you heat sand really hot and you drop down knight's armor, well, you can imagine how hot that would be and how much it would itch and burn as it got stuck in your armor. So people are not dropping boiling oil down the murder holes, but maybe boiling water or hot sand. I seem to recall in the romance of Ewain, Ewain is the knight with the lion, 
I'm pretty sure he got stuck between two portcullises and he was rescued by a really awesome woman named Lunette, if I have that right. So portcullises, there is a reason that we have them on all sorts of pictures of castles. They were very effective at keeping people out or keeping them trapped between them. Also, if your castle has concentric walls, that means there are lots of opportunities to have archers on the top of the walls. So you have archers on the top of the, each of the walls. It could be a long walk from the first gate into the castle to the next gate through the next wall. I believe it was Edward I that added more walls to the Tower of London and he made it a very nasty place to try to get into, which is probably why people didn't do it that often. Now, the people of London did attack the Tower of London during the Peasants' Revolt, but I don't think that it was being defended very vigorously at that time. So the castles have concentric walls, which have spaces. Obviously, they make spaces between these walls. Sometimes these are small spaces that make kind of a passage for enemies to have to get through to get to the next gate. And sometimes there's a big space between the walls. And these spaces were used for all sorts of things. Why waste space when you've done all the work of building these walls? Why waste that space? The space in the baileys was used for whatever was needed to keep people safe and fed and taken care of in the case of a siege. So you'd have things like stables or armories or gardens for food and sometimes for pleasure. I want to get back to enjoying a castle in a minute. You'd have chapels, you'd have barracks, you'd have training grounds, you'd have kitchens because often a kitchen was not actually attached to the keep itself and this is because when you are cooking for dozens and dozens of people, you have to have very, very hot fires. You have to have a lot of fires going at once and so of course a kitchen is a very serious fire hazard and so often the kitchens would be within the bailey but not attached to the keep itself in case of a fire that got out of control. So gardens, barracks, armories, kitchens, that kind of stuff would all be within the bailey itself. Something that you often see in castle baileys is a well. A well is one of the first things that you need in case of a siege because you can live without food for a while, but you cannot live without water. And of course, they knew this at the time as well. But some castles have really great ways of collecting rainwater for use but a well is something that you definitely need in a castle. Also, food storage is something that you need. Each castle would have a place either in the bailey or within the keep for food storage. It's not very often that you find a castle that has an elaborate space for prisoners because you could just put a prisoner in some kind of a storeroom and, uh, well, they're not getting out of there if you guard it well enough. So there are some castles that have things like oubliettes, which are really deep holes where you put someone in and literally the word means forget about them. But not a lot of castles have, for example, a torture chamber or a big dungeon. They might have a cell where they keep people, but it's not necessary in all castles or even maybe even most castles. You could just put someone in a basement room and they're really not going to get themselves out of, not out of the keep, not out of all the baileys without getting caught. So if you're creating medieval fiction, I mean, go ahead and throw a torture chamber in there if you want, but they weren't really a feature that you'd say were part of castles in general. We've passed through the walls, we've gone through the baileys, and we are entering the keep itself. So one of the things to remember about castles is the difference between a castle and a fort is that a fort is only for defense or offense. It's only for military situations. But a castle was also a place where people lived. So castles were not just for defense or even offense, but castles were for people to live in. So we think of them as being these dull, gray, uncomfortable and cold and drafty spaces. But that's not the type of place where people would like to hang out or party. <laughs> to put, not to put too fine a point on it, it's not the place where people would want to live for a long time. So castles are not just for military situations, they were also places to live. So they were more comfortable than we might imagine. So we go to the keep, we walk through the doors of the keep, and the first thing we'll probably see 
is a great hall. And the great hall is not just the place where people ate. It is the place where people ate. The whole community, whoever was attached to the castle, whoever lived in the castle, whoever was part of the community or an invited guest, they would eat there. But that's not the only thing that the great hall was used for. It was also used when the Lord had to render a judgment. He had to hear some of the complaints from his tenants, that kind of thing. That also happened in the great hall. Big meetings, that kind of stuff. So that's one of the reasons why medieval people in their great halls used trestle tables instead of permanently fixed tables. So a trestle table is kind of like putting a board on top of a sawhorse. So they could just come off or be put on and then people used benches to sit on. At least normal people. The important people had chairs most of the time. But these were trestle tables instead of just the four-legged tables that we, we normally have. And that was because it was really easy to clear them away when the Great Hall needed to be used for other things. So I said the important people had chairs. The important people were usually sitting on a dais. I never know if I'm saying that word right because it's one that I've read and, you know, heard in different ways. D-A-I-S, kind of a platform. The important people would be sitting up on the dais and they would be facing everybody else. So if you can picture Hogwarts from Harry Potter, you are picturing a great hall correctly in that you'd have the important people facing everybody else on one side of the table and everybody else it was sitting at these long tables that were perpendicular to that. So the important people are sitting across the hall and everybody else is sitting down the length of the hall and everybody is arranged by order of rank so the most important people are closest to the head table and the people who are less important are furthest away from it and if you're saying to yourself hey this sounds a lot like a wedding you are right <laughs> wedding feasts still are laid out this way with the most important guests closest to the head table and the people that you had to invite seated at the back so early great halls like most medieval houses, had a central fire, a central hearth in the middle of the Great Hall with a hole above it for the smoke to dissipate. Later on, people had fireplaces with chimneys. And of course, that's more comfortable and gets rid of the smoke better. Depending on how big the Great Hall was, you'd often have a fireplace behind the elite spine, the dais, and you might have another fireplace or two along the side, to warm up the rest of the people. But in the old, the old style of Great Hall, you'd have a central hearth. One of the things that Great Halls increasingly started to have was a musician's gallery. If you were rich enough, you could have a musician's gallery, which was an elevated platform, usually at the other end of the hall from where the important people were sitting. And that would be the place where you'd have musicians who would play during dinner or they'd play fanfares as the important dishes were coming out or as the important people were coming out. So musicians galleries are something that you can see in great halls, big and small. Stirling Castle, which is in Scotland, is one that's a bit later. The earlier Stirling Castle was torn to the ground by Robert the Bruce so that no one else could use it. So the one that's standing right now is uh, one that was used at the time of uh, Mary, Queen of Scots. You can see a lot of the same features that I'm talking about now. That Great Hall in Stirling Castle has a musician's gallery. It has fireplaces. It has a dais for people to sit, uh, the important people to sit on as well. And it's got doors for servants at the back. And it's got doors for the important people um, behind the dais as well. Stirling Castle is actually a really interesting Great Hall because if you look up and hopefully there is a place to do a, a virtual tour of Stirling Castle online. It'll be something to check out. If you look up, the ceiling is made like the hull of a ship. And everything is neatly put together, apparently, they say, by the Shipbuilders Guild in order to build a strong roof. So if you look up at the ceiling of Stirling Castle, it's like looking into the bottom of a boat, which is really cool. So we've checked out the Great Hall. We may have had a feast there. I don't know. It seems pretty cool. There we can see there are rushes on the ground or grasses or flowers to keep the floor nice. Um, and it's pretty comfortable. There's tapestries on the walls, hangings, all sorts of stuff that shows how wealthy the person who owns the castle is. But if we go from there, in castles you get to more and more private spaces. You go. So if you are 
fancy enough to be friends with the Lord, then you might be invited to a smaller room, which again would have a chair for the Lord to sit in. It would be painted. The ceiling would be painted as well. You would have nice tapestries. You might have rugs on the ground instead and a fireplace. And this is a smaller room for the more elite people. And attached to that, you'd often have a lord's or a king's chamber. And so you go from a public space to a more private space to eventually the most private space. And the king or a lord would receive the most important people in the bedroom as well. They'd have places to sit. They might sit on the bed, but you'd have a private space that was following, following along from the more public space. So the chambers, the most intimate spaces, would be completely fancy if you could afford it because the people who get there are the people you most want to impress, right? The people you allow in your inner sanctum. So again, you can see painted ceilings, painted walls. You can see rafters are also painted carpets, tapestries, all sorts of really great stuff. Medieval furniture was painted as well. So if you're picturing medieval furniture being kind of simple, um, expand that idea a little bit. It was painted a lot. And again, Stirling Castle has great examples of that if you can see pictures of it. Another thing that you would find in the more private spaces of castle is garderobes, right? Everybody needs to go to the bathroom at some point. And so they'd have little closets with little holes like an outhouse off of your <laughs> off of your bedroom. So garderobes were something that you would have increasingly in um, rich people's homes. Dune Castle in Scotland uh, also has a two-seater for convenience. <laughs> That's something that, you know, it's, it's very friendly. People were not all that fussed about sharing that kind of space in the Middle Ages. Uh, public bathrooms didn't have the walls that we have now. <laughs> but anyway, garderobes would empty either outside the walls, which is great because then it, it's not collecting inside the walls. Or they would empty into a cesspit, which would have to be emptied by a gong farmer, which is not, not a job that you might want to have. But you have to be careful when you have a garderobe that's emptying outside the castle walls, because that can be a vulnerability. Chateau Gaillard in France actually fell because somebody climbed up the hole of the garderobe and let his friends in the front door. So... So you got to be careful with that kind of stuff. But I mean, by the time they get to the keep, you're already in trouble. Because if your enemies have passed all of these walls and they are looking at the keep, you are already in trouble. And hopefully you've got thick enough walls there and you've got enough food and you've got enough water to last. So of all the places where you could withstand a siege or settle in for a long time, a castle is not a terrible place to be. And that's exactly how they were built. That's why they were built. They were built to be pretty comfortable places where you could defend yourself against your enemies. Um, they had lots of different ways that, that you could defend yourself against your enemies. But they were also really comfortable on the inside. If you were rich enough to live in a castle, you probably had a pretty comfy living, especially by medieval standards. So if you were stuck inside your castle, being besieged for a few months, it might get pretty boring at times, but at least you were relatively comfortable and keeping yourself safe. And yes, I am making these parallels on purpose. Your dungeon may be feeling more like a dungeon right now, but just remember that as in a medieval siege, the best thing we can do until our allies bring us some relief and the help we need to fight off our enemies is to stay inside our good strong walls and keep the enemy out. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on, Peter? Hi, Danielle. Well, we have a couple of things to mention for this week. Uh, first, Murray Dom has an 11,000 word piece on Attila the Hun and medievalism. So if you've got like an hour of reading, uh, you can check out, uh, basically, it looks at, at this famous figure and how it gets portrayed in film, music, and opera. So it even gets into Sesame Street. Wow. And yes. we all have the time for that now, right? We do. So, And uh, plenty of videos uh, as well. That kind of, So we have nice clips of movies uh, and music uh, videos where Attila the Hun is referenced. So all that there. And then we also have a shorter piece. It's by Ken Monshine. And it takes a look at a touch in the Middle Ages. 
And uh, I think we're all kind of missing out on that these days. So, and it was uh, a fundamental part of the medieval life too. So a uh, really kind of interesting piece by Ken there. Yeah, I saw that. I can't wait to read it. I'm going to read that soon. All right. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Thank you to all the patrons on patreon.com who are making it possible for me to keep this podcast going. Let me tell you, your support is appreciated now more than ever. And right now, there's more content than ever to keep you busy, as we've now partnered with The Medieval Magazine, a digital magazine for, you guessed it, all things medieval. As a patron, you can get yourself a subscription to The Medieval Magazine or Medieval Warfare Magazine, or even both, at the same time. Find out all the details at patreon.com slash medievalists. For all the best medieval content, you can follow medievalists.net on Facebook or Twitter at medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books, including Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction, on Amazon or through your local bookstore. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thank you for listening while you're under siege. Have an amazing day.